Okay, so welcome to the second part of our week three. And let me first of all straighten out a couple of things that that I mentioned in the uh, previous part, uh, which did not work. So first of all, I started the previous lab with version 6.7 of Nopix, which I did not test and does not really work well for, for our commands. It's okay, it's, it's, it's fairly normal. Nopix is made to be a desktop system, and so some of the server commands are missing. But now with the 6.2, okay, we are uh, in the same environment as we were last week. So we know that our system is installed because I have the Apache folder and then the HTTPD uh, folder has the source files. So first of all, my config file, the configuration file, which is called, what's the config file called? HTTPD.CNF. That's the uh, master you know, it's like the Bible of, 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 uh, of Apache. So what we do here is I will use the VI command to look at my config file. Okay? If you're not familiar with VI, you may choose to do something different. You can go to the start button. The start button that looks like a, I think it's a little plane, but it might be something different. So the little button that uh, normally would be a start button, and then we go to accessories, and try the leaf pad. The leaf pad is a text editor. And you can find the config file for Apache in the place that you compiled it and installed it into, which happens to be under Nopix, Apache, CONF, and this is the file. So, you can actually use a graphical user interface to manipulate the file. And so I'll go ahead and say, um, I'm not sure why. Am I saving the other file instead of opening? Sorry about that. Open. <laughs> Open. Uh, yeah, that would fix my config file real good. <laughs> okay, so this is my config file in, in the um, text editor. Or the same file inside of the command line. If you want to, you can use that Pico or uh, was it Nano? Nano Apache, right? And so you're looking at the same text, it's just reached differently. Okay, so I'll go ahead and just go to my method of doing things, um, but but none of them are uh, are are illegal or 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 just bad. They're all good. In this version of Apache, we start with a line where it says it's based upon the NCSA server configuration files originally by Rob McCool. Okay, so the uh, NCSA um, server project is what I've mentioned the first time uh, during our, our, our lecture, uh, that this gave really Apache its, its initial project start. So I'm going to, uh, to scan down. We talked about the server root directive. Uh, we talked about the if module directives. And in this particular uh, statement, you can see that there is a win, uh, uh, Windows or Network option. And then uh, we talked about the PID module. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, the PID directive. And uh, let's see, here the timeout is 300 seconds. In the Apache 2.2 file, it was only 60. In this one, Keep Alive is on by default. And uh, uh, maximum uh, alive request is the same. Keep Alive timeout, I think, was 5 in, in the two versions. So you can see how that, how that changes. The MPM, pre, uh, um, well, so the pre is right here under if module. We discuss the start servers, minimum spare servers, maximum spare servers, then killing this uh, 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 or, or having the maximum client per servers. So per each server, you can have only 150 <coughs> connections. And then in this version of Apache, the maximum request per child is zero, which means that this one will not recycle uh, after so many requests. So you can see how. Uh, the strategy 
changes <laughs> across versions because the code that's used in 2.2 may behave differently and that's why the default settings are, are changed there. And this right here would be for the worker uh, or threaded uh, approach uh, in, in the operating system. Okay. And here is an if statement for the behavior of threads on the Windows system. Uh, here we have some of the other operating systems, which brings us down to the listen directive. Now, if you are running Apache as an Apex user, but you compiled it without specifying the port directive, then you have to modify this to 8080 in order to start it as Apache, right? So that would be one um, directive to start with. Okay, I think we stopped our review. We stopped our review in the other file. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, all right, all right. So in this version of Apache, the server admin directive uh, comes at the top where you can put in the email address that, the, that will appear, for example, when you direct when you do directory listing and you show all the files in the directory, at the bottom uh, there might be uh, an email address of the administrator. Okay? So that, that's where it, it would be pulled from. Uh, use uh, canonical names would apply to times when um, when your server is uh, is accessed through a different URL. So let's say that someone is using the IP address or maybe some secondary DNS name. You can uh, force the server to actually rewrite those to uh, the server name that you define in the config file. Okay, so, so you, you, ca you can do that. Okay, document root is a very important directive. Document root defines in Apache where we will store all our HTML documents. Okay, so in, in the 241 class, we had uh, this one project with Drupal where we use the C Drupal uh, location, and that happened to be our document root. So whatever you put in that document root, you can pick it up on the other side through the web browser. So if you were to put up a, a, a file under home Nopix Apache HT docs, call this file index.html, then you could open localhost index.html and it will show that file. Okay, that's document root. It's different from the other directory we talked about, server root. Server root just says your main installation reference is right here. Okay. Okay, another great directive called directory. This directive is different from other directives because it's a container di a directive. A container directive has an opening tag and a closing tag. Some parameters can go immediately after the word directory in, in a container, parameter, uh, container directive, and then other parameters go between the two tags. So for example, uh, for the root directory, so this slash right here, that just means for the root directory, you're going to start with following symbolic links, if such exist in the HD docs, and then make sure that you do not allow any overrides. And we'll talk about those in a minute, what the overrides could be. And so as we scroll down, we have another directive, uh, a directory directive. Now we're saying, okay, for a directory that is located under home Nopix Apache HD docs, which is our, our document directory, apply the following uh, the following um, parameters. Options will include indexes. So, if the directory has files in it and the user provided just the name of the directory, make sure to show all the, all the files inside of it. Let me demonstrate uh, what, uh, what this might look like. Let me open um, a new tab here and I'll go ahead and start my, my system. Whoops. Okay, so now I'll start my system, and now I'll navigate uh, under localhost, 
port 8080, and let's say that I'm going to icons. Okay, this is what the options index will do. Basically, this uh, particular uh, display, it doesn't exist as a file. I never had to configure the HTML for it. Apache created this HTML on the fly, and it even connected those little icons to the files, uh, extension files that, that we have here. And this is the options uh, indexing. The indexes in Apache can be very, very sophisticated. Let me give you an example here. And I'm um, um, shooting a little bit in the dark, but I, I think this might work. Um, uh, all right, here is another example of how the index directive can be, can be used. Uh, you can specify a new header for whenever indexes are put together. So in this instance, I put together a small HTML file that has this picture and, and some text in it. Then I specified at the bottom my, my custom footer. And so what I end up with is a nice index of, uh, of files. Now I remember about another one. Um, uh, RaiderCast. And by the way, this URL you can use um, if you're looking for recordings of our, of our um, sessions. So under year 2012, okay, note what I did here. I have a pretty picture of a, you know, it makes, makes, makes me look like a movie maker. <laughs> but all it is is just a picture that I included inside of the header of the index uh, module. I added some instructions here. Then at the bottom, Okay, I have a link, I have a footer, but in addition to the entire process, you know what I was able to do? So I was able to specify, uh, I was able to specify per extension of the file, additional HTML. So notice that this text is added to, to this specific extension file. And I did that so it sort of brings out the file that you're supposed to be clicking on, right? It's all done automatically. Apache is indexing these files automatically. All it is is just one directory with a bunch of files in it, right? So this, uh, this index is a, is a really, useful, um, really useful element. And so, of course, you can add JavaScript. You can use Flash. Any browser-based uh, technology that you want to uh, use here, you can add to those custom headers and footers and, and the definition of, of, of index. All right, so, uh, so that's, that's the index. Let me go back here. And you have to say options, indexes, if you want to allow that. And follow, symbol follow symbolic links. Uh, you can tell Apache, OK, uh, my users are required to use their own files. If they try to cheat and use these Unix shortcuts, like symbolic links, uh, then, then don't allow it. Right? Most of the time today, symbolic links um, are useful tools enough that we just allow them. And, and they, they're not really security considerations. So they're, by default, you can see they're included. Then we say allow override none. Okay? This just means that, by default, we do not want end users to have their own directives. But it shows you the power of Apache, where you can say, I know I'm really smart. But sometimes my users have needs per directory to define their own directive. And so you can allow that. You'll say allow override all, or you can say allow override auth config. And users then can create a little file called .htaccess, and then they can put a password protection on any directory they want. Right? So this is how, how Apache would, would control that. And then we have things like order allow. Right now, these two don't do anything, okay? But you could say, allow from local host. And then your website is only available from local host. Or you can say, deny from, and you can specify IP address of someone you don't like, right? Or maybe an IP address that is a problematic, maybe you get DOS attacks, denial of service. Yes, Terry? You can put a list of IP addresses. Yes. Or you can put, uh, uh, three sets of numbers, dot star, 
and then you have a whole you know uh, wild card of, of addresses and we'll, we'll get to it we'll have a lab on this at some point where we'll talk about the uh, the order of allow how you can man manipulate that okay this other set of directives okay has to do with Apache installations that allow Unix users to have their own home web pages. Here's a great example. Okay, let's say you go to raider.grcc.edu slash tilde username, right? And you, I don't know if for this class I made the request, but if you are in the 241 class, you can navigate to a directory you'll have your own. So this tilde tells Apache, okay, this is a user controlled directory instead of going to home Nopix Apache HD docs go to home username and look for the specific name of a directory and so whatever the user puts in there it'll be displayed under this URL and so the way it works is you have to say what is the key directory to look for in the user directory and then you can specify additional directives that, that make that happen okay you know, it's useful for us on Raider to allow all the students to have their own little website. But notice that you have to have a tilde to make that happen, right? Without the tilde, it's not going to work. All right. Then the directory index, uh, important directive that says, if, if the end user provides a directory as the URL, then in this directory, look for a key file, like index.html, and show that by default. Most of you web developers know that index.html just shows automatically. Well, this is how it happens. So if you want to change that and you say, no, no, I really want uh, a file called uh, signon.html, you could edit. You can have multiple files here that are <coughs> edit, and then the sequence of them matters. So that if you have two files, the first one will be the one that will be showed, showed as index. So if you have index.php, you would want that to be first. So if an end user puts, not end user, if the developer puts index.html and index.php, you probably want the index.php to have priority over the HTML. So that's directory index. Uh, that's, so the bottom line is, as we walk through this file, is that everything you've ever seen done with a web server can be done through these directives. Is, so yes, say, yes. Um, when you see someone load a page and it comes up in your flash and then says, you know, skip this or mm -hmm. go on to the site, you do that there? Okay, so the way this website will be arranged is I would put the flash object tag into index.html. Oh. And, and in that page, I would have through HTML a link for skip. And then that link would take me to maybe index 2, right? Uh, but ba basically, whatever you put in index, whether it's Flash or anything else, that's what typically shows on, on, on the website. And the um, and majority of, the of time today, it's index.js or index.php. It's some kind of a server-side page, not just HTML. All right. Going down, access file name goes with that override directive and it just says if you do allow user to to have their own directives which can be good or bad right but if you do allow the end user to have their own directives what is going to be the key file to look for on windows it, it's a little bit harder to create a file starting with a dot on unix you, it, it's actually a hidden file so that's a nice thing sort of out of the way but the very next directive the files match Notice what it does. It says, if you match a file on the file system that start with, the caret means start with, and starts with .ht, then deny from all. So that way, if you, in the HD access file, put some security information like, hey, here's the link to my password file, or do this and that, those are hidden directives. Therefore, when an end user tries to pull it up in the browser, access will be denied so notice it says order first of all consider all the allow options then overwrite them with the deny options oh by the way deny from all right so that basically makes these files unreachable out, uh, outside of the server 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, so you could really get your um, developer, you know, up in the arms if you, if you delete maybe the dot, all right, <laughs> and then any file that has HT in it, you know, would be a problem. So, uh, yes, and, and, but, but files match itself is really nice because it's independent of all the other if statements that might be there, and uh, it just matches the names of files themselves. So yeah, and yes, you can you can you can do it extensively. So what you could do, for example, you could say, uh, allow from this IP address these types of files, but these types of files are not allowed from another IP address. So really power, powerful mechanisms. Okay, going down, types config, the, and, and this is a reference to a file called mimes.types. Okay, let me show you how this might work. Um, Apache, okay, the file called mimes.types is here, <coughs> and simply in this file we match extensions of files to the header that's going to be sent out to the browser to explain the behavior. So if you have a file uh, uh, let's let's look maybe for uh, a, a simple file type, maybe like uh, HTML. Okay, so when you have a file that ends with HTML, in the HTTP header that you send along with it, make sure to say it's text slash HTML. This in turn will tell the browser, download the file. By the way, it's a text file, but when you render it, render it as HTML. The different option is this. If you have .txt file, make sure to send it with a header text slash plain. Why? Because then the browser will know not to render it as HTML, but just to display it as is. Okay? Great, uh, great uh, connection and puts you in the driver's seat. You you, you're empowered to, to modify things. I think I tried, yeah, I think I tried, uh, I tried to show that to you. Uh, uh, earlier, what was, was it MSI? It was some file that, that, that wasn't behaving as expected. Um, but anyway, uh, y this is where, where we will have uh, JPEGs and w a any of the other files, you see, you set the correct header. Yes? So, uh, could you mess with people and like, put something weird there? You could always mess with people and put something weird there, yes. So let's say that you have a GIF file and you can say open it as Excel spreadsheet and it would at least send that information to the browser. Or you can say, okay, all my .csv files, I want them to be open as text. You know, I don't want them to be pumped to an Excel spreadsheet. But so it all depends on, on what your website does. Um, let me see. Uh, the one time I actually had to mess with MIME types, I did not do it through Apache, okay? Um, I, I had a project, I had a, a website that tracked projects, and at some point we wanted to store files in the database. So if you, um, if you attach an Excel spreadsheet, we want to store it in the database. Now that the file is stored in the database, you see PHP is able to connect, grab the data, but when PHP sends it to the client, the page could be something like file.php. So you would modify the header and send the application type, whatever the Excel header is, and so, out of a PHP file, uh, out of a PHP extension website, it would actually launch Excel to open to open uh, the file, and the data comes right out of the database for all the rows and, and the cells. So sometimes there is a need to actually uh, manipulate these mime, mime types. Okay, uh, let's see. And so now we set the default. Okay. If there's an extension that you have not seen <laughs> before, send it as, a, as text, is what it says. All right. Um, now we have another setting for, for uh, an if module. If, if, if magic MIME types are, are a set, then execute additional or look for an additional config file. Hostname lookups, a very interesting uh, directive. It basically says this, whenever a user accesses uh, or asks for a resource, JavaScript, HTML, 
we know what their IP address is because there's an IP connectivity between us and them. So you have an IP address to work with. Well, in the log file, by default, this IP address, their IP address, is put in. But on some servers, you may choose to look up this IP in the DNS server. Whatever request, don't give me the IP, I don't know numbers. Tell me where they came from. Oftentimes, you'll have information like they came from dot, uh, dot .au, or you know, the country they came from. So some people do go and say hostname lookups on. But what, what they th what, what's the problem with doing that, do you think? <laughs> well, uh, right, so if a library accesses uh, the system, all of them look like, like the same, but that's, for an IP address, it will be the same. Think about the overhead. Now, let's say that your website is successful, and you have per second maybe a hundred or a thousand connections, all right, and all this load is now going to the DNS server, right? You, you don't want to uh, do that because that's going to be huge overhead. So host lookups off mean that in your uh, log files, you actually will see the raw IP addresses. You can always reference those back. So having an IP address, you can find out where they came from. Um, and there are projects that uh, will provide you the database, actually, that matches the IP with the location. Uh, you can have a little map. Oh, I'll show you this. Uh, in the um, 246 uh, class, I, I, no, this is 246. In the, two, in the 241 class, um, I did this little uh, widget, which basically is just a picture that you put in on any website, and then it shows you, you know, where, where the people came from. Because uh, it, 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 every user has to download that picture, so then they store the information where the user came from, and you can go and look it up on the map, right? But that's the idea, that once you have the IP address of whoever the, the, the requester is, uh, you can later on process it and do all kinds of um, interesting things with that. Um, all right, um, let's see. Hostname lookups. Okay, let's let's see. I'm going to look for some of the uh, uh, uncommented, right? Uncommented uh, major uh, major uh, uh, directives. Speaking of comments, let me say this: comments are very powerful tools, not just for documentation, but for version control. So let's say that I choose to change this directive for error log. Instead of just making the change and saving the file, I can put the original directive in place and then modify the new data. Now, I have the previous version of the code and then the new version of it in one file. So comments, very, very powerful. Uh, I would also add my initials and the dates. Perfect, that's exactly, that's exactly it. So I could say here, uh, changed by uh, like this on, and so we have uh, 123, right? And so this now gives us versioning, it gives us uh, change control, uh, all those things that typically we miss from, <laughs> from files. So it's common in Apache, okay, a big red sign, it's common to make a change to the config file, save the config file, and walk away. What happens then? I forget what it was. Do the changes take effect immediately when you save the file? No. See, the file is only read when the system starts. So you've done this great job and you change all the config that you thought was needed and the website is working just like it was and you think, tomorrow I'm going to have to make more changes. And then your replacement or you know your partner, your night uh, your night uh, technician comes in and they have to restart the server for some reason. And now the new config kicks in and they have no clue what happened, right? Because you modified it and uh, it, it looked good to you. Maybe you forgot that you have to restart it to make it effective. And now they have all kinds of problems because there are no comments of where the changes were made. Um, uh, let, let me show you a, a trick that you can use. It's not a trick. So. So let's say that, that this is my original uh, config file, and I'm going to make a copy of it, right? Make a copy of it, call it 123.12, uh, 
whoops, like that. Now I have two files that currently are identical. Now I'm going to go and, and, um, and make some, uh, some important change, uh, like uh, the listen directive. I'm going to change the listen directive from 8080 to 80. The smart thing to do would have been to include comments, but I didn't do it, so I'm going to save it. Now I can see that my files are different. These two files used to be identical, now they're different. But, you know, short of printing it out and comparing with a red pen, here's the command. You say DIFF, this file, and this file, and it runs the difference, and it shows you only the places where the file is actually different. Okay? Now, you have to have the original file. <laughs> if you don't have the original copy, now, if something isn't working at all, then you go back to your backup from the previous night or two nights before and then you bring out the file and then you run the difference and then you search for the guy that made the changes and didn't, didn't restart, right? Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's how, how, how that might work. Uh, let me see about other, other config pieces that might be uh, might be of interest. So we went through the directory, we went through the user directory, index, name of the file, type, hostname lookups, uh, error log. Okay, error log is, is, is important because it tells us the location uh, of the log file, and this is the name of the file. You see there's not, no dot log at the end or dot txt, it's just error underscore log. And uh, whenever you restart the server, whenever a user had a problem accessing a, a resource, it goes in the log file. And so this is important. The log file uh, for us <coughs> is in the logs directory, and the name is error.log. And so you can see that uh, in this instance, it says file does not exist, so someone got a 404 message. And the file it's looking for is called <laughs> favicon.ico. Anybody knows what that what that's all about? Any web designers that are familiar with favicon? <laughs> yeah. So see, there's a little icon there. If you don't have that icon populated, the browser is built in such a way as to ask for it, and then it gets the error 404 not found. Uh, so. Um, if you go to uh, other websites, and any of them will have that, you have that, that fav icon, right? You can actually say uh, fav icon dot ico, and it and it <laughs> and it actually shows it. Yeah, that's a very old version of this website. Um, I th think the the new one will be right here somewhere. No, Drupal actually is smarter than that. So anyway, um, that's, that's the error log file. Let's, um, let's look at other ones. Um, log level. Would you like your error log to have a lot of information, or would you like to have only a few pieces of information? You can set the log level to error, and in production, it really should have error level. Because people uh, have all kinds of problems with web servers, and in production, right, unless it's really important or you're debugging something, you should not use up too much disk space and activity for error entries that are not useful, right? And so that's why you might set it to error level instead of warning. Next, we have a whole list of log format options, which we're going to go over in another lab. But basically, you can manipulate what's inside of the log file, how detailed the log file should be. All right, um, notice that in this edition of Apache, the server token is not the first <laughs> directive, right? It's uh, fairly down there uh, towards the bottom. And uh, in this version, you see it gives us all the options right in the config file. Whereas in the 2.2, I had to go to Google and actually <laughs> look them up. All right, going down, uh, server signature. This, this is the signature that will appear when you have uh, the indexes uh, or when you have error messages, like uh, file not found, and then it'll say 
email the, the email to the server administrator. Uh, let's see if, how that works. Uh, if, if that if that's actually working on our local host. So if I was to misspell something on purpose, uh, no, I so I have the service signature, but I don't seem to have the the email on. So if I change that to email, and now I restart. So I go to bin Apache restart, and I go to rerun. Well, what happened here? Oh, I think, <laughs> you know what I did, which is pretty silly. <laughs> See, I changed, <laughs> I made the change. <laughs> so um, I made the change and I didn't restart and so, uh, some of my uh, some of my scenarios are 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 true. Okay, so let's restart this. And now you see the local host changed into a link where the email address from the server admin directive is in place. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go to config file, and so email like this. Oops. Serve signature. Excellent. And now we have a series of, of directives called um, aliases. Aliases basically are uh, like logical folders. Okay, think of them like logical folders, URLs that you sort of create, but they don't exist perhaps in htdocs directory. So what I can say is home Nopix Apache icons can be mapped to a URL called icons. You know, when I tapped in icons, I got the listing of all the icons. Well, that's not, that was not a directory that existed in htdocs. This directory actually exists under home Nopix Apache icons. And so you can create, and you do that specifically for utility folders, you can create aliases to different parts of the operating system. Right, right, because with CGI, you actually have to add additional uh, permissions. So that's why it's, it's, it's a special, um, this right here. See, uh, not only do we say alias, we say script alias, because it automatically allows execution of programs, which is very dangerous these days. A much better way of doing server-side programming is through um, modules like PHP or Perl. CGI bin means <coughs> you can have a shell script with access to the entire box and execute something. Or you can have uh, on Windows an exe file that you know nobody knows what, what it might do. Okay, uh, index, index options is a, a variable now uh, or, or a directive that uh, allows us to extend uh, how the automatic indexes are created. Fancy indexes is what I showed you earlier where you can actually add the header and the footer. Um, and uh, right here is where you manipulate those icons. You saw where I had that HTML that created additional green text. Well, this is this is where where, where I did that through uh, through the uh, um, through the add, uh, add icon options. And notice right here, you can have um, oh, that's not it yet. Uh, there's uh, I think below there's a header and footer option. Yeah, there there it is. See the 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 readme options. Though that's the header and footer for the automatic directory listing display where I showed you some of those uh, uh, movie lookalike uh, let's see where are we here that's the header and then that's the footer for for the index options okay um, these are all options um, we have support for languages so you can have uh, index.en page or index.pl and you can actually put different languages inside and the server is going to try to recognize what the browser setting was so if the browser header has a country in it it'll try to adjust the page today we don't use that as much why because index.php serves everybody so what you will more likely do is you'll have your translation done in the database so every button and every comment has multiple 
uh, entries in the database for a different language. And then your index.php can also access the browser submitted headers and give the correct language. Or you may have a drop down that says select your language and then set it as a cookie and then provide the correct uh, language. There are many uh, ways for interna internationalization of your website. Uh, the bottom line is not very many people use it, right? So you have to be a global company to, to have a need for, for all languages. You just uh, put a link to Babel, you know, Google, whatever that uh, fish is, and they can just copy and paste. Now you didn't hear it here. Um, fancy language, okay. So a character set, let's see. We talked about the ad types. So ad types uh, right here are slightly different than just the MIME types. Ad type allows you to enable modules like PHP because you can say link this extension like .php with this type which will enable a module. So add types and we will do that later on where we add PHP support to our server and so uh, we'll use the add type uh, directive. Um, error document, great opportunity to make your website very interactive instead of having the default messages delivered. So by default, when you have a missing page, Apache knows what to do. It'll say 404 page not found. What if you wanted to, to say it nicely and say, uh, hey, uh, I'm sorry you didn't find this page. Would you mind clicking here or giving the search option? So all you have to do is you uncomment error document, provide the HTTP error that you'd like to address, and then provide the location of, a, of, a, of the HTML page. It could be a PHP page if you want it to be. So the great thing that many systems do is instead of actually having this be an error, you can, you can um, trace or redirect all URLs to a 404 handler. So if someone types in uh, GRCC at the end of the directory, I can have in the database where the GRCC URL matches a specific file or specific record in the database. Okay? So in the document error, I can say, take it to index.php, and this, whatever they typed in, is going to be as a query string in the URL. Then I can take that query string through the file that I specified, like in that, that PHP. And I can show them the correct page because I can take the query string, look it up in the database, and display the body of the page. So now I took the error, what normally would be an error, and I made it part of the application so that I don't have to have the URLs as, as physical elements on the file system, but the URLs are simply triggers that go to the database and show the correct files. For example, in, uh, in Drupal, right, the URLs are all stored in the database as a, as a, um, as a um, uh, URL uh, path. But you see, all of them in Apache, because they don't exist physically, they will create a, a 404 error. Only we are able to handle it. If we don't find it in the database, then they really spelled something funny or, or incorrectly. Then they will say, oh, I'm sorry, but this page does not exist. We display a pretty picture. We give them a search button. And, uh, and, and, you know, uh, give him a hug, you know, welcome to our website. But then, you know, as you type in URLs, again, you can look them up and get them right from the website. So a very powerful directive that, that, that enables you to, uh, to work with database um, records. Okay. Um, these are fine. Uh, let's see. So browser match is another set of directives okay, that allows you to customize how Apache will deal with this specific browser that, that came up. The same, the same information can be captured in your PHP script so that when a mobile browser comes to your website, you send them to a mobile website, right? You can handle this because HTTP, uh, HTTP header will have this information in it. But if you would like Apache to do this for you automatically, you can. 
So if the browser matches, and, and the browser has a specific header in it, so if the browser matches whatever word you put in, then you're going to do something specific. And some of the things here uh, you can reset not to keep alive. This browser just doesn't support this technology. Don't do it. Uh, and you can see Mozilla, you know, two that would be really old. Uh, uh, MSI uh, 4, I think that's for Internet Explorer 4, okay? <laughs> so real player of this kind. Uh, so uh, you can see, uh, so th they're forcing a response of the HTTP protocol to a specific, a specific version. Um, so you can see how Apache has these built-in workarounds. Again, because of uh, uh, the developers, most of those developers are web administrators who are fixing their own problems. And that's sort of the principle of open source, you know. I wish Apache could do that. Well, let's sit down and write it in. And that takes us to, uh, to the bottom of the, of the file, which is uh, virtual hosts. And right now, all of this should be commented out, which is fine. And we have an entire lab on virtual hosts where you'll be able to see that you can actually redirect to different parts of your system, different directories, per host name that's being requested. And so we'll do that. And a quick note on this statement right here. Uh, first of all, I like to have all my directives in one file. There are many directives, but at least I know that if I'm looking for something, it's going to be there. N well, Apache does allow you to have an include directive, which means that, hey, let's say that I want my developer to manage part of the file. I can say include, so add to whatever I provided in my file, add some other file to it. So SSL is commonly offloaded to a, a different file uh, where we just manage uh, uh, paths to certificates and uh, encryption levels and to how the negotiation takes place with the browser. But that's the include directive. And some operating systems, I think it was uh, Slackware, um, which basically, instead of having a single HTTP.conf, they do split uh, uh, the file into many, many small config files. Um, in a way, it can be good because if you only have to see a part of the config, then it'll be clear, you know, nicer. Uh, but if you have, uh, and typically it's the case, you know, you don't have multiple uh, website administrators. You, you, if you have one, <laughs> then, then you have one, and then having it all in one file works okay. Steve? If you had multiple developers, can you just give them each you see, the, and uh, that's a little problematic because yes, you can, but it doesn't prevent them from maybe including other directives. So the include file by itself doesn't delegate the work well; it just gives them access really to the to the config file. So instead, when dealing with developers, it's better to enable the .ht access file and let them then manipulate settings because .ht access file has limitations. In that HD access file, you cannot modify all options and directives. Whereas when you give them include from inside of the config file, it's just a text file. So it doesn't just say, just because you include it and you call it SSL.conf, doesn't mean that you can only manipulate SSL configurations. Yes, yes. We'll have, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lab on, uh, we'll do a couple of things. We'll manipulate the uh, IP access to, the, uh, to that folder and will create that uh, um, basic auth uh, for uh, securing with a password a folder. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, so, so all that is exciting, and that's the bottom of the file. So what, what we did today might have seemed a little bit boring, bec because it was. <laughs> you know, you could have read this file all by yourself, okay? But what I wanted to confirm is that our entire administration of Apache is going to take place through this one file. And when you change a directive, you are changing the behavior of Apache, as you saw with my port 80, right? I was showing you how not to do it. <laughs> I showed you the difference. And then I restarted, and I found out that, that it was the wrong port. So uh, whatever you change in the config file, it's going to have uh, some visible uh, change in uh, in the server. The bottom line is that with Apache, you do not modify this all the time. You find how it works, and then you 
basically forget about it for a long time. Now, unless you work for you know a, a place that has just a lot of different Apache systems, or maybe you support other administrators, so then you have your hands full with these directives all the time. Um, but the the inside knowledge of this config file, uh, it it is powerful because you can solve many problems that maybe the IT department is struggling with, right? I think I mentioned be, before this uh, little uh, module called spell uh, or spelling. You're going from a Windows host or a network host to a Linux host, okay? Before the URLs were not a big deal. Well, you can't go through Google or all the websites that link to you and tell them, could you make sure to correct your upper and lower case? <laughs> Right? You can't do that because people copied and pasted, and whatever it is they typed in, it's there. And so uh, through a simple module and inclusion, activating the module, you can make it so that the website is suddenly not case sensitive on a case sensitive host like Linux. Yeah. Good deal. So what I'd like to do the rest uh, of, of the period for today is for you just to play with this config file. You can change the port, change it from 8080 to some other port that's greater than 1024. Then restart and see that that takes effect. You can manipulate things like the email <coughs> administrator. And next week, we'll have a lab where we'll actually start uh, manipulating these uh, per instructions. And um, if you want to, it's a good time to rerun through the installation process uh, from the beginning. Uh, the more you do it, uh, the more comfortable you'll get with it. And uh, now is definitely a good time to sort of catch up if you're not feeling comfortable with it. Uh, get some of those commands uh, down. I know the syntax is important. You know, you misspell, you miss one space, and it's not going to work. But at least you'll get used to some of the messages that look like errors versus messages that are OK. All right, so, uh, so let's do that. Thank you for, uh, for, for uh, uh, being patient with me and, and some of those long directives. And uh, we'll resume next week with a lab on how to manipulate uh, the file itself.